for Sunday and we are um, receiving the grace of God today. Um, let's just pray. We're, Father, we ask this morning that you bless us with your presence. We ask, Lord, that your presence fill all, way, all our homes where our people are gathered this morning. We ask, Lord, that you speak to our hearts this morning, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you will bring change, you will bring transformation to our lives in Jesus' name. We pray for healing. We pray for miracles in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning we'll be talking about the good heart and, and the evil seed. Right? So um, a lot of time we talk about the good heart and having a good heart in church. But today I, I want to look at both the good heart and the evil seed. What, what happens when there is some interaction between the good heart and the evil seed? And I'll start this morning with the parable of the sower. That's a parable that um, a lot of people are, are familiar with. And we'll look at that again and, and try and look at it from, from maybe from a different perspective this morning. Um, I'll start from Matthew chapter 13, um, verses 18 to 23. And I'm going to go a bit fast, um, skip a bit, but I'm just going to tell the story largely. Uh, Matthew 13 from um, verse 18. And Jesus said, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. And the seed sown, and, the, and this is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they, that, they, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to, the, to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, making it unfruitful. And in 23, it says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. The good heart, the good soil is the one that is able to produce a crop. Right. So, I mean, there's there's several possible situations in which the heart could be or the soil can be. But the one we are dealing with today is the one that's able to take in a seed and produce a crop, produce a crop, right? And the question we are trying to address today, so I mean, the, the, this parable is essentially um, looking at the, a, a good seed, right? The farmer goes out to sow the seed, in this case, which is the word of God, right? And, and, and falls on different types of heart. The question is, what if a, an evil seed falls on a good soil. What happens when an evil seed falls on a good heart, right? It is a good soil. The reality is the good soil has the capacity to produce, right? It, it doesn't matter if the seed is good or evil. If I have a good soil, I have a good heart, and I'll, I'll allow evil seed to fall on that good soil, that capacity for me to produce 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold is going to be activated, right? And we'll look at this um, as we go on to see a bit more. So, I mean, Jesus continues to another parable in the same chapter 13, and that's a parable of the weeds. And in 24, he says, Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 25, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And this parable continues, and this parable is, is I mean, is primarily describing the interaction between the kingdom and the world, but I'm trying to draw some principles here. One, that it is possible for evil seed to be sown on the good soil. Because it says here first, the seed that was sown initially was a good seed. But the enemy came and sowed some evil seeds. And it says, it was while everyone was sleeping. 
There is a situation that allows the enemy to be able to sow evil seed on good soil. And, and he says, after he sowed the seed, he didn't wait around to nurture the seed. Because the end, even the enemy knows that a good soil will produce with any seed that you sow on it, right? And he says, he went away. He understands the principle. All he needed was that opening, was for men to fall asleep. All he needed was, was, the, was the passive connivance of the keepers of the field, right? Falling asleep, and, and, and he entered in that window, sowed the evil seed, and went away. Scripture says that when Jesus was tempted, right, that after he had resisted the enemy, that the enemy went away until an opportune time. That is a principle that the enemy understands. He goes away until an opportune time. And in this case, he found an opportune time while men were sleeping. And he sowed the seed, he sowed the evil seed on good soil. And the scripture here tells us, right, that, I mean, when, when, the, when the keepers of the field went to the master to tell him, he told them, wait till the time of the harvest, because the two will grow, right? The two of them will mature, right? So that capacity is in there for the soil to produce with whatever seed is sown in it. And, and, and generally, that's, that's the way we are trained. That's the way our minds are trained. That's, we go to school for several years. People sow seeds in our minds, and we are trained to make something out of those seeds. And so it is important that we... We pay attention to what is being sown, right? Because once it is sown, it now becomes a, another, an, another you, we've opened up another challenge. Then we, what, will we, what do you do with this um, um, seed that is going to mature, the weeds that's going to mature, and of course, threaten the, 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 good, the, good, the good crop that we had in there before? So, I mean, it, it's important that we are conscious that there is an enemy that is intent on sowing good seed. And this enemy understands, clearly understands this principle. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, seeking an opportune time. Seeking for so somewhere a good field where the keepers are sleeping. And there are two questions we, we, we need to try to address today. One is, what do I do if the evil seeds are already sown on my good soil? And the other is, how do I stop the enemy from sowing evil seeds in my field? And those are, those, those, those are things that we all need to deal with, right? Because one, we were not, all, we were not even born as good soil, right? We, we've, we've been in different places through different things before we come to Christ. And then we need to start the journey of, 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 of renewal of our minds and all that. I'll go to another story in the Bible in Genesis chapter 25, um, from verse 21. This is a story of Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, and their sons. And, and we'll just pull some principles from there as well. In Genesis 25, verse 21, it says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. In 22, the babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? And, and that's a question a lot of us are asking ourselves, right? Because there's a jostling of the wheat and the, uh, uh, and the weed in our lives. There's a jostling of the good seed and the, and the evil seed in our lives, and we're asking, why is this happening to me? Why is it that I desire to do good, but I have all of the struggles to contend with? And in 23, and, and it says, so she went to inquire of the Lord. And, and that's an important part, right? She didn't, she didn't stay back. She went to inquire of the Lord. And in 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. 
two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Key parts of this one is, she, she said, why is this happening to me? And she inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, two peoples, two nations are within you and they need to be separated. Separation is an, is an important principle of the faith, right? They need to be separated. The solution to the jostling has to come from separation. I'll, I'll, I'll go on with the story of Rebekah and we'll go to Genesis 27 from verse 5. Now, Rebekah had inquired of the Lord. Um, the Lord had told that this is what is going on within you. And we'll see what, what happens in the, in the course of the story of this family. And we're just going, trying to drop um, um, principles. I don't want us to get distracted with sibling issues and all that. The, the, what we're trying to draw from this are the principles. In verse 5 of 27, it says, Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his, son, to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I have overheard your father Say to your brother Esau, bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock, bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I will appear to be tricking him and will bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. Right? Now, Rebecca had inquired of the Lord and she knew there had to be a separation, right, between the two nations jostling within her. And now she found out that this, this, was a, this was a critical moment in that whole process, right? She had to take a side, right? And, and I don't want us, again, to get distracted with the sibling part of it, but with the principle, if we've come to God to inquire, there is there's something going on within me, right? Why is this happening to me? Why is this, this, this jostling within me between two different nations, between different forces? And, and, and God said, there has to be separation. The next thing is we need to be ready to take a side. We cannot play the two sides. It is impossible. We cannot play the two sides. And Rebecca stepped forward here and said, let it, let it cost be upon me. I, I, on, she had some back, she had some knowledge that, that, that was not available to Jacob and knew a separation had to occur. And in, 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 in Rebecca's way, this was the way she was trying to make that separation happen. And, 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 for, and that's the principle I, I want us to draw from that scripture Right? There, there's jostling. There's a jostling between the good seed and the evil seed, between the wheat and the weed. The question is, what side are you on? It's not only important to, to be concerned and cry and, and worry, but you need to take a side. There has to be a separation. And that's a principle here. And, and, and I mean, it says that Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord. So I want, to, I want us to inquire of the Lord together today, right? One of the ways we can inquire of the Lord is through the scripture, right? We have the jostling in us, and we want to ask the Lord, what should we do? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, chapter 5 from verse 16. We, we are asking the Lord, we have this, why? I mean, there's something going on in our hearts, in our lives, the enemy has, has, has sown some evil seeds. There's some evil seeds we've carried, carried over from our past that we're still dealing with. And we want the Lord to help us. And in verse 16, it says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
In 17, it says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There is no middle ground, right? There is, it's, it's the two forces are at war. I mean, the one, is go, one desires one thing, the other desires another thing. Right? This is a jostling that, this is, I mean, similar to the jostling that Rebecca was experiencing. And it says, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. I mean, you, you, you cannot be indifferent to this jostling. You cannot stand aloof, I mean, concerning this just, jostling. You have to take a side. The question is, are, are you going to take a side on, on uh, I mean, to, with, the, with the flesh or with the desires of the spirit? If you take a side with, 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 the, with the spirit, then you also need to be, con I mean, conscious of the need to try and choke off the, the flesh, right? If we go back to the, to the parable of the, of the sower, Jesus, one of the types of soils that he mentioned is, is, is where the seed falls on the thorns, right? And what the thorns will do is choke off, choke off whatever is pla planted near it, right? And that's one of the things. One is we want to have the good seed, the good seed mature into fullness. We also want to be ready and willing to be sure that we are not, we are not supplying the, the evil seed, right? We want to allow the evil seed to starve to death. We want to choke it off while we continue to strengthen the good seed. And in, in Galatians, and I'll go on in Galatians chapter 18, it say, I mean chapter 5 verse 18, it says, But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, and, and those are big, big names, right? Those are things we will all be really, really concerned about. But there are some that are more subtle. Hatred. Nobody even knows. It's just in your heart. Discord. Jealousy. Something as, as something that may seem as trivial as jealousy. Fits of, of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. These are pretty... Um, seemingly subtle items, but God puts them on the same pedestal as sexual immorality and witchcraft and all of that because in his eyes, all of these are still in the same, they are, they are part of the evil seed that would choke off your, your, good seed, your good seed if you do not do anything about them. 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, and, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't say may not. It says will not inherit the kingdom of God. And when we read um, scriptures that touch, talk very definitively like this, we need to be doing some self-examination. Right? If, I, if I apply this scripture to myself, am I on the path to inheriting the kingdom of God, or am I not on that path? And if, I mean, depending on what your answer is, you need to be taking some action. And, I, and I'll invite that you interact with us through the comments sections on, on, on the different um, platforms that we're using, right? I mean, do your self-examination by yourself. Are you on the path to inheriting the kingdom of God, or are you not? Are you, have you allowed any of these seemingly subtle items, jealousy, envy, and all that to take root in your heart such that the, the, you, you are choking off the good seed that God's planted in you? We need to remember that this Galatians was written to a church. This was not a letter to unbelievers, right? I mean, it says the, the, the let, it was a letter to the church in Galatia. So Paul, Paul was writing to a church, to people like us who, who, who are in church, and he says, if you allow these things to continue to, to mature and, and blossom in your lives, then you will not inherit the kingdom. And that's why it's important for us to take sides. 
We are taking sides because we want to secure our place in God. We are taking sides because it's important for us to, 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 to be able to secure our place in God. So how do we take sides? We'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. How do we take sides? In verse 8 it says, Be sober, be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Don't sleep off like the guys that were sleeping when the, when the enemy came in. It says, be of sober spirit. Be on alert. That's, that's important, right? We cannot be um, lackadaisical, unconcerned about the work of faith. We, we have to be on alert because there is an enemy that is trying to sow bad seed on our very precious good soil. And that soil is going to produce if the seed gets sown. And, uh, or, uh, or at least it adds to the number of, uh, of, the, of the species of weeds that you will have to be dealing with. So, I mean, so there's no reason to, to allow that to occur in the first instance. It says your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In 9 it says, but resist him. Right? That is, it's, it's, it's an action. It's action. Right? You need to do something. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. This is, a, a, this is something we all share, right, as believers. We need to resist this enemy and we need to be firm in our faith. That you, you, I mean, it's, it's important to want to resist, but you cannot resist unless you are firm in your faith, right? Resisting requires some, 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 some capacity to be able to resist. If, you, if you're dealing with, with an enemy that is compared to a roaring lion, you need some capacity to be able to resist him. And the scripture says to do that, you need to be firm in your faith. And I believe Apostle Peter went on to explain what it meant in 2 Peter chapter 1. Right? To throw some more light on what it means to be firm in your faith. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Make every effort to add to your faith, right? You need to add to your faith to have the capacity to resist this enemy. It says, make every effort to add to your faith. And, and that's a question, again, for us. This, this is a point where we can self-examine again. How have you been adding to your faith? What, how have you been adding to your faith? What have you been adding to your faith to increase your capacity to be able to resist this enemy? It says, add to your faith goodness, to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, right? So you don't just add to your faith once and you are done. It's an ongoing adding and adding to the faith because we are, we are continuing to, 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 to build capacity to resist an, 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 a, an enemy that is very ferocious. And it says, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Right? That's a word that ties back to the to the, to, the, to the basis, we, I mean, we're working with the principle of famine, right? Unproductive. It says, if you add to your faith, if you add to your faith, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. If you add to your faith, you are able to resist the enemy. You will be able to lock him out from sowing weeds in your, in your good soil. And you will be able to protect your good seed. So that your good seed can come to maturity. 
He says, if you add to your faith and continue to increase in that path, they will keep you. <clears throat> right? It's, 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 it's a principle. It's not, it's not, you don't, you're not, try, you don't need to try to keep yourself. You need to add to your faith, and by adding to your faith, that will keep you. You build that capacity to keep you, to keep your field, to keep your field from being unproductive, to be able to bring your good seed to maturity, and also to be able to keep away the enemy that is trying to sow evil seed in your field. That's what enables us to, to resist the enemy and also to, to, to be effective, right, in bringing what God has committed to us to maturity. In verse 9 it says, but whoever does not have them is, near, is nearsighted and blind. And if you are blind, how do you keep watch? Right? It says the enemy came to steal while they were asleep. Right? They were just asleep. Now imagine they were actually blind. It will be coming every time of the day, just walking in and out because they don't even know somebody is coming into their field. He says, but, who, but whoever does not have the distance, whoever is not adding to their faith, whoever has come to church, I gave my life to Christ, I'm born again, and so, I mean, life continues the same way. And I'm not adding to my faith. I'm not developing. I'm not building knowledge. I'm not building self-control. I'm not building discipline under God. I'm not, I mean, following my, I mean, walking on godliness. It says they are nearsighted and blind. They do not have the capacity to perceive. They cannot, so, and, and if you cannot perceive, how do you watch? It says be, alert, be sober and be, be on the alert. But if you do not have the capacity to perceive, then you cannot be alert, right? So it's, it's important that we build, that we add to our faith. Because this enemy is, 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 is waiting and prowling and will take advantage of anyone that is not that is not ready to, to resist him. In turn, it says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm. And, 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 and this is, this, you, and you hear a lot of this in some of the scriptures that I'm referring to today. Make every effort. Down the line, I'll, 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 I'll define that some more. It's, 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 Applying all the diligence. It says, make every effort. Spare nothing to confirm your calling and election. If you do these things, you will never stumble. That's what the scripture says. That may not be your experience because you've not done these things, but that's what the scripture says. That if we, if we do these things, if we make every effort, if we follow the Lord, if we grow under him, if we grow, I mean, by the spirit, it says, you will never stumble. The question is, what if you don't do these things? What if you don't make every effort? What's going to happen in your life? And that's, that's a, we, again, we need to self-examine. We need to interrogate our own journey in God, right? Am I, am I adding to my faith? Am I making every effort in, in the journey of my faith? Or is, is this just one of those things? Our call is to be separate. He called us to depart from amongst them. It, it's not, it's not a, it's, he didn't call us to modify our old lives. He called us to step out of the old life. And so, and, and that's, and we need to make every effort. And, and we need to, we need to realize, right, that these things are written very clearly. If you don't do these things, you will not inherit. If you don't do these things, if you do these things, you will never stumble. That means if you don't do them, you will stumble, right? And if you stumble and stumble and stumble, the likelihood is that you will fall. <clears throat> and so we, we need to self-examine. We need to test our process in God to see if indeed our process is, what, is going in the right direction. The other question we'll, set, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with is how do I stop the enemy from sowing evil seeds 
in my field. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. This, this prowling enemy is there, always ready, waiting for, for, for an opportune time. This enemy has been doing this before we were born. Right? So this, this is an enemy that is, that is, that is well, that is food ready. The reality is left to ourselves, we will not be able to even match him. But we have the help of the Spirit of God. We have the Word of God. Right? And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's written to us what we need to do. In 14, verse 5, uh, Ephesians 5, 14, it says, This is why it is said. This, for this reason, is why it is said. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. Right? If you're sleeping in your walk of faith, Scripture says you're dead. Right? It says, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, right? If you're sleeping, <coughs> it says you're dead. But it says you, you still have the opportunity to wake up. And Christ will shine on you. If you wake up, if you get up to make every effort, if you wake up and commit to adding to your faith, it says Christ will shine on you. In 15, it says be very careful. Then... How you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Be very careful. Another version says, walk circumspectly. The, the word, I mean, um, 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 the word interpreted, careful, be very careful here means to be diligent. It means apply more thorough investigation. Don't just look at things on the surface. Don't just glide through life. Don't just slide through. It says apply more thorough investigation about the transactions in your life. Investigate, query, right? Interrogate the transactions that are going on in your life. Ask the question, where is this leading me? Not just how does this make me feel? Interrogate the questions in your life, the, the, the transactions in your life. How? Where is this leading me? Not just how does this make me feel? Because most times we are too concerned about how we feel, but the faith is about a pilgrimage. And the question of faith is where we are being led to, not how we feel in the present. Because everything present is passing. And so what is more important about the transactions of our lives, the transactions in our hearts, what we're letting, what, we, what we're taking, what we allow to take root in us is where is it leading us? Not just how it makes us feel. And it says, be very careful. Be deliberate about that, right? Be, be aggressively determinate about mounting a guard over your heart, over, over the transactions of your life. Because scripture says that, that's what determines the outcome at the end of the day. And if we don't do that, it says we are unwise. But he wants us to be wise. For in 16, it says, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Left to themselves, the days are evil. That's the default, right? If you pick up a piece of, of metal or even just the walls in your house, if you don't tend them for a long time, they will go back to the original state. The paint will fall off. The metal will rust because things will naturally go back to their default or lower state. But scripture says we must do something. We must intervene. We must disrupt that process to make sure that our lives do not go back to the default and lowest, low, lowest state, but that we can stay in, in, in the realm that God designed us for. And it says, make the most of every opportunity. The word opportunity there is the word kairos. It's a time, a season of opportunity, right? It, it, another version says, redeem your time. Buy your time. Invest something to, to make sure that your time does not go, I mean, your life does not go back to the lowest state. 
if you want to stop your walls, your, the pain from falling off and your, all your walls just go back to bricks. I mean, if, if you go to some of the very old houses, you will see even the bricks start falling off. In Yoruba, they say it's own circle. The house basically starts throwing stones, right? The stones start, I mean, I mean, I mean, breaking off from each other because they are trying to go back to their default state. Unless there is an intervention, there is a disruption of that process to hold, so that you can hold them in place. And he says you need to buy up, you need to invest. That word opportunity means to rescue from loss. So you, you, as individuals, we need to again test and inter interrogate our time commitment. Are we, well, what are we investing our time in? Is it invested in, in things that contribute to maturing the good seed? Or are we spending time on things that potentially actually feed the evil seed? Because the, 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 you, cannot, you cannot change the principles. What you can do is change the inputs. You can change what you put in, the inputs to the system, to the, to the processes, but you cannot change the principle. If you feed the, 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 the crop on a good soil, it's going to mature and blossom. If you starve it, then you have a chance to choke it and disrupt the process of its maturing. So he says here, yeah, we need to make the most of every opportunity. Every. And it's, it's, again, it's, 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 it's so beautiful the way the scriptures are written, right? It's clear, I mean, the, the thoughtfulness, the clarity. Every opportunity matters, right? One little seed, the evil seed, that is carelessly sown on your soil, you could be dealing with it for tens of years. So he says, be, make the most of every opportunity. Ask questions. Ask yourself questions. Question yourself, what am I committing my time to? And, and what is this going to yield? Where is this leading me to? What exactly am I getting out of this? What, who, I mean, what side am I taking? By committing my time to this, what side am I taking? And do an audit of, of how you use your time in the day. How much of that is actually feeding the good seed? How much of, 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 of the time, of how you invest your time, is feeding the good seed? And depending on what your answer is, the solution should be clear to you as well. We'll take, we go to another scripture in, in, in Proverbs. And definitely this is a scripture that is important when we, when we talk about the issues of the heart. Uh, Proverbs 4.23. And this is about gatekeeping, right? We, we are essentially gatekeepers of our heart. And that's a function where you cannot afford to be weak. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else. Above all else. I just said we need to audit how we use our time, right? How much investment are you making in maturing the good seed? It says here, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. The, the New American Standard, Standard Bible says, watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it flow, flow the springs of life. The word translated diligence here actually means a place of confinement. It actually means a prison. It means, I mean, I mean mounting a guard post over something. It's that intense, right? It's, 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 it, what it's, ask, it's asking you to secure your heart with the same intensity that people used to, to secure a prison, prison, to ensure there is a confinement. You have to mount a guard post over your heart because if you fail there, Everything will follow. It says, mount a guard over your heart, for from it flows the springs of life. The word springs there means bothers, right? 
the source of life, it means the source of life, it also means the escape, the escape from death, right? That it, 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 it's by, be, if you, are, you need to be able to secure the border of your heart, right, to, to escape from death. You need to secure and establish the border around the source or the spring of your life, or else death will encroach. If, if, you do, if you do not secure that border, then there is, a, there, is a, there is a strong enemy that is prowling and ready to encroach. So we, we have an important duty and task to focus right, on our hearts. Finally, I'll take one more scripture in, 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 in Matthew 7.13 as a roundup. Matthew 7, 13 says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. I mean, the, the scripture is very clear. Where it is leading, it's what is important. And you know what leads to destruction. It's a wide road. Anything goes. The one that leads to life is a smaller gate where you need to be interrogating what's going on. <clears throat> In 14, it says, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And so that means you need to be searching for it. In Luke 13, 24, it says again, make every effort. The word there is to struggle, contend, to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. So we, we need to look at our lives and make adjustments, right? We need to deal with the, with the issues of our lives. Where, what side have we taken? Have we taken the side of the, of the good seed? Are we trying to bring the good seed to maturity? Or have we taken the side of the evil seed? Are we nurturing the evil seed? Where, what are we doing with our time? There are, no, there, are no, there, are no, there are no middle grounds here. This is, a, this is an issue of life and death in the, in the faith. And so there are no middle grounds. We need to take a side. And you need to take some time with yourself and do some self-examination. Any of those scriptures where the Bible says things like, will not enter, will not inter inherit. We should not just read them and go through and go, and go away. You need to ask yourself, what is that saying to me? Am I entering? Am I inheriting? And if you're not, you need to be making adjustments. Because it is written. It is written. It is already written. Amen. Let's just take maybe some, a minute to just, I mean, think, to meditate. Right. Am I, what, have I, what, what have I been doing with my life? What have I been doing with my good soil? Am I managing this good soil like the, those, those, those farmers that were sleeping and allowed the enemy to come in? Or am I the, 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 the one that is mounting the guard on my guard post and ensuring that I don't allow the enemy to sow stuff, to sow weed in my, in my, in, in my, in, in, on my good soil? Am I the one that is, that is ensuring that where, the, where, there is, where, there is the, where is a, there's already some weeds in my, on, on, in, in, on my ground, I am, I am actually consciously working to starve them? Or are you feeding them? And how's your width? You know, even in that story, he says, let's wait for the harvest. But if your wheat is not being fed, it will not even mature at the harvest. So there will be no harvest. And there will be no differentiation. Because you need the maturity to be able to differentiate between the weed and the, and the wheat. So as, let's, let's pray today. I ask you to just pray. Right. And, and this is, for me, this is more about obedience than prayer. But I'm asking you to pray because we always need God's help. I ask you to just pray, right? I don't want to hear this word and just walk away, Lord. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me to do something. 
Help me to be diligent. Help me to be diligent. Steer me up. Scripture says he steer. I mean, Jesus was steered up and, and, he, and he, went to, he went to the desert to fast. Steer me up. We, we need a steering. We need some help from the Lord. We need to be steered out of our complacency. And to deal with the, with the pertinent issues of our heart. We have a journey. We have an inheritance. We cannot concede our inheritance to the enemy because of carelessness. We cannot just concede when we have the capacity to resist. We, we, we steer up ourselves. We receive the capacity to resist. In the name of Jesus. We receive your help, Lord. In Jesus' name.